He's a partner in James Associates, Indianapolis. His remarks will be a summary of the kinds of activities that James Associates has been involved in in the energy area. They will include solar studies and applications. His case studies will include uh, VA hospital work on existing and uh, new sections of a VA hospital in Indianapolis. Some studies they've done regarding the Indiana Convention Center in Indianapolis and a variety of different schools. Tom Dorsty. I would like to review the activities in our office since about 1972 in regard to energy use. I want to start back with the Science Engineering Technology Building on the campus of IUPUI in Indianapolis, which was a systems building designed at just at the end of the point in time when people weren't concerned with energy. It's a responsive building. It did everything right, except it did not respond to the need for conservation of energy. About 1973, the next building we designed, which was based on the same general plan for responsiveness, did include the need for energy conservation. And that building was a ball corporate building here in Muncie. We examined the various types of hardware on the market, the various kinds of systems on the market, and that building is a central uh, variable air volume system with a fixed volume system on the perimeter walls. The next thing that happened to us was an interest on the part of some of our clients in solar energy, active solar energy. We became involved in a feasibility study for the Indiana Convention Center for uh, the use of uh, solar heat. With the help of uh, Dr. Jan Kreider from Boulder, we put together a feasibility study. This, and I might point out, was the third study we'd done. We'd done two other buildings. And in no case could we make those buildings feasible economically. In our experience, there's an owner who is also the user uh, such as a corporate headquarters who builds a building for their own personal use. There, there is an owner who is a tax-supported uh, entity who builds a building for the use of the public. And then there is an owner who does not use his building, but his building is an investment that has to return an earning on his initial cost. All three of these owners take a different view of energy conservation. The owner who does not use his building, but expects this building to be leased out and expects a return, is responsive to energy conservation, provided you capitalize it. In other words, he says to you, when you do your life study costs, inflate it, if you will, which is a good guess. Tell me what I'll save over a period of years, and then tell me what that money 10 years from now is worth today. In other words, he's saying, how much can I spend now, which is not earning me money, to make that saving? And that's the difference between the man in the private sector and, in general, the man in the public sector, because the man in the pu public sector doesn't have that cost of money. OK. After doing two studies, neither one of which were feasible, we did a study for the Indiana Convention Center. And believe it or not, it turned out with a payback in uh, eight years. The only reason I know that this worked was because of the very erratic use of the building. It would be occupied, depending on circumstances, from anywhere from 12 to 12,000 people, from anywhere from a period of a half a day to a week. And these things fluctuated every year, every day, every month. And the only way we could put the study together was take a typical year's program, align the use of the building with the information we got from the Weather Bureau and Flight Service as to the weather for that day, hour by hour. And we ran it 12 times through a computer program. And believe it or not, with about 18,000 square feet of collectors on the roof, 
and 45,000 gallons of storage, we could pick up 43% of the heat requirement for the building. And you've got to recognize that when there are 12,000 people in the building and the lights are on, there wasn't any requirement for heat at all. It was a requirement for air conditioning. So what, what it said to us in the end was, the solar heat was ample to heat one system, which was the offices and the corridors, and pick up the load at the times that the un un other spaces were unoccupied. So they said, go ahead, get a federal grant. They didn't have any money. <laughs> In the time we started the program, this was now starting phase three of Urge's programs for funds, for grants. Phase one paid about 80% of the cost of a heating system or whatever. Phase two paid 68%. We found out phase three would pay 50%. And not only that, but they wouldn't consider it unless you air conditioned as well as heated. We started that study, got about three weeks in it, went back to the board and said, there's no sense in it, just forget it. We're wasting your money because the, there's no way that air conditioning is feasible any way you look at it. You'd have to take all the chillers out of the building, replace them with uh, steam absorption units, run them on hot water at 200 degrees or less. The efficiency will be about 66% of what the machine is made to run on and there's just no way it's going to work. Plus, you'll have to come up with a half of a million eight hundred thousand dollars. So that ended the whole study. The funds that were appropriated, we're still going to use for a retrofit study to see how we can save money in the building. Then we go to the VA hospital. In the course of the design, they asked us to study specifically, well, they said two things, which turned out to be 12 things. They gave us three high efficiency collectors. And they said, we want you to study the use of those collectors mounted on the rooftops, because the, if you're familiar with the hospital in Indianapolis, it's roughly eight stories high and it's up and down. Or mounted on the south side of the building vertically behind a glass skin so we can maintain it from the inside. And they gave us the three collectors. They gave us two locations. Uh, well, when you multiply all that out, you've got a zillion studies to do. We did the studies. Not one of them was feasible simply because the information that was available from the manufacturers was so vague that there was no way we could come up with any figures. They were new pieces of equipment. They were high efficiency, reflectors behind them, sealed tube type collectors. Nobody knew exactly what their operating uh, characteristics were. Nobody knew exactly what they were going to cost. So we investigated on our own a Lennox flat plate collector that's been on the market for years, which turned out to be feasible. In that case, let's see, they can return their investment without capitalization in 12 years, and as far as they're concerned, that's good enough. So that's designed in the building and will be built as part of the building when it's bid in about three weeks. We have also done Erda studies for about a half a dozen schools. Uh, we have put uh, active systems in for swimming pools and domestic water. We've never been able to make one, one work in this climate from the standpoint of real heating except the convention center. And I think the reason for that is the erratic use. Okay. So we had this under our belts it's in our, and still do as far as active solar systems are concerned. After we did the ball building, in which we discovered that a variable air volume on the inside of the building was extremely useful, we used a fixed air volume around the edges to pick up the, literally the heat loss and the heat gain and maintain the center, uh, responding only to lights and people. That was a good step, and we did reduce costs. The next building we tackled was the Dow Chemical Building in Indianapolis, which is again an owner-user building. He built it for his own use. In both cases, these clients were inter interested in capitalized cost of future savings as well as escalation. So we went through the studies, and in that building, well, let me back up a minute. In the Ball Building, which is a precast concrete frame, we discovered a benefit from the lag time of the buildup of heat in heavy masonry on the outside of the building. It was useful to us in the sense that the sun load on that building 
would lag over in the night and help to heat the building when it was unoccupied. At Ball, the, it's a thin skin, say six inches, with a backup of studs and bad insulation. At Dow Chemical, the walls are 24 inches thick, and the windows are recessed to the inside of the, they're not even within that 24, they're recessed a full 24 inches, and behind the precast is a two inch stud system that has the window set into the stud system behind the precast and two inches of uh, styrofoam, to making a complete envelope on the inside of the building. We also looked at the, here again, this was variable volume, which, which incidentally works extremely well in a large building which has a specific time of use, like uh, eight to five and three hours for cleaning or whatever. We looked at this and we took the next step, which said we'll heat the space above the ceiling on the top floor with unit heaters on their own thermostats to take care of the nighttime loss through the roof so that there will be no loss from the interior space below it. And we'll do the same thing on the perimeter with units, uh, here again, still using the variable volume, but adding to the variable volume system a fan box, which would work independently of the variable volume, and recirculate the air from the plenum space back to the occupied space, and shut off all outside air, and shut off the entire variable volume system. This took the next step, and we got the total energy in that building down to 54,000 BTU per square foot per year, which is about 1,000 BTU less than the current government standards uh, for targets. The next building, and I'm still talking variable volume, was the National Retail Hardware Association, which is a smaller building, but still about 40,000 feet. And we carried the thing one step further. The entire center section is variable volume. The ex perimeter is hot water radiation controlled by an outdoor thermostat so that there's no control on the interior in terms of interior uh, uh, changeable thermostats for that perimeter heat. This means that once adjusted properly, and that took a little time, but once it was adjusted properly, the only thing needed besides that is cooling on the interior space and possibly cooling in part of the perimeter which was on the unheated or on the heated side. So this boils down then to the fact that the building has a variable volume system that takes care of 80 percent which has a cooling coil in it and no heating coil. There's no heating coil in the system at all. The normal load in the building will require cooling in the center section. It will also introduce cooling in the perimeter section when this is, re is, uh, is uh, required. And the nighttime operation is set up in such a way that the entire variable volume system goes off. And again, the heat loss at the roof line is picked up by small unit heaters above the ceiling. And that's all that operates at night. Everything else in the building is turned down and uh, using a, a standard U factor of 0.09 everywhere, walls, ceiling, the whole schmear, except for windows, this building will go through the night and then pick up again when the system turns on in the morning and not be below about 63 degrees. We don't know what the, we know what we project for energy use, but we don't know what it is yet because they, they moved in in November and we don't have a full year's operation. Then the next step, well, let me go, then the other thing that we feel is extremely valuable at this point in time is both water source and air source heat pump systems for other kinds of occupancy. The 1633 Medical Tower is a private development by a private developer who intends to make a return on his investment. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, this developer was extremely interested in operating costs provided it's capitalized and he knows what it's worth him to him today to get that money back over the life of the building. The end result of that building, where there are, uh, let me describe it, it's about 300,000 square feet, 100, uh, there's a hotel of about uh, 140 rooms, there's 100,000 gross square feet of medical offices, 
about 20,000 feet of commercial space and a 350 car parking garage. Well, you can see the variety of uses. The hotel use is obviously one thing. The medical offices are a total different thing. The third floor of the building is occupied by Methodist Hospital and an ambulatory clinic. And about a third of the space requires 100% supply exhaust because of medical use and negative pressure. Well, the one thing that would respond to all these requirements was a water source heat pump. Every suite in the, in the building has two zones, an exterior zone and an interior zone, and they're all controlled from within the suite. So that if somebody rents an office, he has an exterior zone, an interior zone, and he controls his own temperatures. We also, at this point in time, became deeply involved in the electrical side of the energy thing in terms of lighting and got into all of the ramifications of different kinds of lights, different uh, uh, efficiencies in terms of lumens per watt, and also discovered the three-tube fixture, which everybody at first we thought that's nuts, three tubes and two ballots for three tubes, but anyway, what it wound up with was we could turn that building down for cleaning purposes with one switch to one-third of the lights for cleaning after it was uh, the occupant had left. Whereas under normal conditions, the cleaning people would turn all the lights on, leave them on until 2 o'clock in the morning, and then turn them off when they go home. But with, with master control, all they can do is turn on one-third of the lights, which is adequate for their cleaning. It turned out that the piping system in the building was adequate storage for the hot water. In other words, the building was large enough that the piping system would store enough water that the interior portions of the building, which required cooling, supply enough hot water to the exterior that only under, under the most severe conditions does the boiler kick in at all. Okay. As near as we can tell at this point in time, energy, total energy in that building, and I'm almost afraid to say this because I think there's something wrong with it, for six months was 17 cents a square foot, which would be 34 cents a square foot per year, but it's only partially occupied, and I don't know what that does to figures. So, you know, we'll find out in the future. This building led us into the next step. We were disenchanted with active solar heat, but we became interested in passive solar heat. It has a d distinct and direct application to residential units, but we feel it has a distinct application to other types of buildings as well. A heat pump is a real neat piece of hardware to pick up excess heat. If you introduce monitors on a roof, and orient the building properly so that you pick up the winter sun and heat the plenum air from the sun and pick that heat up in the heat pump units and store it in a water tank. You can reverse the whole process. You'd use it in the daytime in the perimeter and use it at nighttime to pick up the nighttime loss of the building. I want to, this may be a little difficult, <clears throat> but the monitors on the roof are set in such a way, and the building is oriented in such a way to pick up maximum heat, maximum sun uh, source heat in the winter. The heat pump system and the return air are in the plenum so that this heat is picked up in the plenum into the heat pump, back into the water system, used if there's heat needed or stored if there's heat not needed. They have a uh, one building now designed this way, ready for bids, and once it's bid, we'll have solid information to determine what sort of capital investment that is and what sort of results we're going to get from it. It takes the heat pump and the normal uh, advantage of a heat pump and uses that advantage to pick up solar heat of a passive nature. Now this also, for the same token, we're talking about direct and indirect passive solar heat in buildings in the winter. At this point in time, the federal government has spent money and encouraged research on active solar heat and all the sophisticated hardware that goes with it 
and had done absolutely nothing about passive until recently in Los Alamos, a group that's a spinoff of the nuclear people, have done some real solid research, and they're coming up with enough experimental work to provide you with a method of determining what to expect from this sort of passive heat in an engineering sense. We feel that this combination of passive heat with the solar system and also as it relates to both variable air volume and water source heat pump will allow us to take the next step in energy conservation. And this relates to the use of mass in the exterior of the building as well as the interior of the building which can be heated passively and the insulation quality that we feel is a standard of, in today's industry using 0.09 for about everything, walls, roofs, the whole, the whole skin, the whole envelope. Uh, let me just find another one here. Then all of this leads us into the problems of retrofit and what you can do with existing buildings. We've worked for about uh, 10 years at Taylor University in uh, Upland, Indiana, and studied Williams Hall, which is a men's residence hall built about, uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. We went through it. We found out what they were doing. We discovered uh, things that could be done to the building, roof insulation addition, reduced the window area, didn't put in thermopane, increased the wall area, increased the, the insulation in the walls and infiltration control, changed the heat gain and heat loss, changed the makeup air system in the kitchen, and wound up with a savings. The existing building took 420,000 kilowatt hours. The remodel building took 128,000 for a saving of 292,000 kilowatt hours. It's a reduction to approximately 30%. And this one transparency shows the life cycle analysis, analysis of it without considering capitalized cost. The next step and I'll just let you look at that while I'm talking about something else. The next step, and we used this first in the 1633 Medical Tower, and I've used it since in other buildings, was reclamation of heat from exhaust air. That building had about 28,000 of exhaust, 28,000 cubic feet of exhaust, and about 3,000 more supply for positive pressure. A heat wheel, in that case, which takes the air, the exhausted air, to heat basically the incoming air before it again is heated into the, uh, to go into the building as makeup, saved about 750,000 kilowatt hours per year in that building. We know that. It's been in operation long enough for us to know it. And it also made us think of something else. We used to pressurize buildings pretty heavily so that all the infiltration was exfiltration and not infiltration. And now we're trying to size that so it's just barely positive pressure by uh, cross-controlling supply fans in variable volume system with the return air fan with a static sensor in the ductwork so that when any room shuts down, the static sensor senses the change in pressure and immediately shuts down the both fans to maintain a, a very narrow difference between supply and exhaust just enough to, to handle a situation. This is an energy saver. The net effect is, as near as we can tell, we have cut energy costs from 1973 where we had double duct systems, we had reheat systems, uh, two pipe and, and four pipe uh, cabinet unit systems. We reduced the energy use to about 50% of what we were doing at that point in time. And I, I think it's, uh, it, it's an evolutionary process, and you keep learning, and I think we can reduce it even more. 
There's only other one, one other thing I want to point out. One of our biggest problems in all of this turned out to be the clients because they didn't know what in the hell we were talking about. <clears throat> so one of the men in our office, the guy who was in charge of our mechanical system, wrote a little booklet in layman's terms which starts in the front and describes all the available systems. And then he says what's wrong with it and why they use a lot of energy. That, then he gets into variable volume and describes the system, the control system, where it's applicable and why, and what the advantages and disadvantages are. Then he gets into water source heat pump. Then he gets into air source heat pump, water source heat pump with storage tanks, solar. That takes about that much. Other, other energy conser uh, conservation measures, including heat wheels for recovering heat of exhaust air, double bundles to recover the heat from uh, air conditioning systems rather than wasted through a cooling tower, points out the use of solar as a passive source, and then has a list of lamp fixtures and lumens per watt for fluorescent, mercury, metal halide, and Lucalux and lists the lumens per watt initially at 75% of life, at 40% of life, at the end of life. And this is where an owner says to me, why in the heck don't you use a 1,000 watt Lucalux, which has 133 lumens per watt, rather than a power groove fluorescent, which only has 69, or a high output that has 75. Okay, I point out to him, and it has a 24,000 hour life. The fluorescent has a 20,000 hour life. But at 40% of life, that one is down to 118 lumens per watt, and the power groove is still 63. At the end of the life, the power groove at the end of 20,000 hours is 59. The Luca Ox is down to 53. So it's It'll last forever. It'll last 24,000 hours, but at about 12,000, you're not getting, you're getting half the light out of it you started with. So you have to watch for that kind of a bug in the engineering that's data that's published on light fixtures. I'll quit. Questions? What's your engineering done in-house? The engineering's done in-house, but we use Dr. Jan Kreider of Boulder, Colorado for energy conservation plus solar consultation. He works with us. And there's a guy in Los Alamos on passive, and I can't remember his name, and I didn't write it down. Maybe somebody knows who he is. Doug Balcom? Who? Doug Balcom? That's the guy. Right. On your uh, water base, water source heat, heat pump, where you were using basically the piping in the building as your as your heat store or as your water storage unit, uh, in the summertime with cooling loads, do you ever? Uh, what do you do in terms of rejecting that heat, where you get excessive heat in that circuit? In the summertime, it's a bypass to heat domestic hot water, not to 120 degrees because it won't do it usually, but at least to start the heating process on domestic hot water, and then switcheroo the valves around in the winter and let the, the normal source for domestic hot water take over. Uh, you said something about that I didn't quite understand. Uh, you seem to be saying that you're using uh, passive solar heat on uh, massive masonry with an embedded uh, uh, hot water pipe, which was uh, then being to a tank? Did I get that no. Right? No. What I said was we're, we have discovered that massive concrete exterior walls will hold the heat of the sun on a cold day long enough to lap over into the nighttime period and, and reduce the heat loss at night. 
It has nothing to do with the heating system inside the building. Because even with a passive system, you've got to still have some sort of a mechanical system in the building to use the passive system. You've either got to have a, a variable volume system with uh, uh, a vane system, or you've got to have a water source heat pump system. You can't eliminate those. There's just no way to eliminate. You've still got to have some kind of a system in the building. Thank you very much, Mr. Doors. <clears throat> Well, we've got one thing left. Uh, Jack Haley, who spoke earlier, uh, is willing to spend the last uh, few minutes uh, making some summary comments about the various speakers we've heard from and uh, some general issues that we've identified. Uh, we will be trying to get out to those of you that have participated some uh, follow-up to the conference, and uh, um, you'll hear from us again on that. But for now, Jack Haley will, uh, will summarize the events of the day. Well, you almost did it for me. Along about 3 o'clock, the sun came out. But for those of you who have been here since then, it's raining again. So uh, uh, I'm going to go back to Georgia. Uh, I thought this was a very, very interesting day. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed all the presentations. Uh, the uh, Cole Associates building. Uh, the uh, Credit Union Solar Building, the Sod House. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about these buildings. I've learned a long time ago that I keep my mouth shut <laughs> about other people's designs. But it, I, I think everything's very interesting. One, uh, one item that bothers me, and it's been bothering me for a long time, uh, this is in this whole area of energy redesign and solar energy, it seems to be that the big uh, stumbling block is payback. And do you realize that until we got into uh, retrofit and solar, this was an unknown word in, really in our profession? Did anybody ever ask you, any client, uh, what the payback period was going to be on his variable volume system or his terminal reheat system? Or did any of you ever consider in your own homes what the payback period on your gas furnace is? We've never considered it, and yet it seems to be a big stumbling block, particularly in the area of solar. Uh, a friend of mine who's a builder in the Atlanta area and is completing about his ninth or tenth solar house now, I think has taken a very reasonable approach to the payback period on a solar system. He started with his own house, which is about a 2,400 square foot house, in an area where natural gas is unavailable. And I know in a lot of parts of the country I've been in in the past year, this is becoming a fact of life because the local gas companies will not make any more hookups or, or do any extending of gas mains. Uh, Kerry Keith built his house uh, about three years ago. His alternative to the solar system, the solar heat pump system he put in was all electric. Now, in that area, the average uh, 24, 2,500 square foot home, which is all electric, enjoys uh, a monthly average electric bill of 125 to sometimes 135, $140 a month. Well, Kerry uh, figured that his solar system, the difference in cost between his solar system and putting in, say, an electric uh, uh, air to air heat pump or a conventional all electric HVAC system was about $6,000. He uh, had an eight and three quarter percent 30 year mortgage on his house. And that works out to about eight dollars and change a thousand. <clears throat> so 
his $6,000 extra for his solar system was going to cost him $48, $48 to $50 a month for the life of the house. Uh, after a year, he found that his average monthly electric bill was around $40 a month. So he has, say, uh, $88 to $90 a month for his solar system as compared to, say, $130 a month for a conventional system. So he's saving $40 a month right away, and he's not a bit concerned about payback. And this is the way he is selling solar systems to his, the people he builds houses for. He says, you're not, you're not paying a lot of extra money. What you're doing is putting a 30-year supply of energy on your mortgage. And it's a pretty good way to look at it. Another thing in the, in the commercial area, uh, I had a client a couple of years ago who wanted to build it. This was a small new bank and they wanted to build a headquarters building of about 50,000 square feet. And uh, they asked us to do a feasibility study on it. Well, the way it worked out with escalating utility costs, and again, this had to be an all-electric building. There was no gas available where they were building it. The 50,000 square foot building was going to cost about a million and a quarter to build. And amortized over 30 years, the amortized cost of the building would be a little over uh, two million dollars. But conventionally built, like every uh, small office building in our area, uh, which is, let's say, $25 square foot construction, uh, probably a lot of glass and panels, and uh, maybe if you're lucky, a VV system, would have probably a utility cost of about a dollar and ten cents a square foot a year. Well, you take that utility cost and escalate it at the rate it's been going for the last five or six years and run that out for the next 30 years and you find that at the time the building has amortized itself for two and a half million dollars by that time they've spent uh, 11 million dollars on uh, utilities and so then we said if we design a very energy efficient building properly oriented and, and uh, doing everything we know to make this building as energy efficient as possible, we can cut that utility cost down by 50%. And so the same building isn't going to cost any more money because the extra money we spend in orientation and in a better shell and so forth uh, comes out of money we save on the mechanical systems. And so the same building amortized out in 30 years at the same cost, but the utility cost was $4 million. So they picked up $3 million in the life of the building. And then we went a little further and uh, looked into a solar system for the same building, and we looked at $150,000 for a solar system. And uh, that would have added uh, about $300,000 over, the th uh, no, about $500,000, I think it was, over the 30-year period, and yet the utility cost would be down to about $2.5 million for that same period. So again, we weren't at all concerned about payback if you look at it in the long run. Uh, I, I just had one question from Mr. Butterbaugh on Fort Ben Harrison. Uh, did you do anything in the way of uh, uh, modification to operations of the buildings to reduce energy consumption? And all you talked about here was, was physical modifications to the buildings. Uh, operational procedures in hours and temperatures in uh, light levels and uh, all these, uh, these things I talked about this morning that we find we can uh, pull down energy costs by 25% without spending any money. We would, uh, we, we did something with light levels because the Army itself has lowered their 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's unfortunate because there's your, there is where your greatest opportunity uh, to make a showing is. Uh, I have one suggestion for coal associates. I'd suggest you restudy your parking. I noticed, I believe, that your parking your parking lot is on the north side of the building, and in the site plan, the cars all face the building. And in the summertime, in that situation, the sun hitting the windshields of those cars are going to bounce back many, many thousands of BTUs right on your building. If you park the, if you just turn the cars 90 degrees, you'll drop that. We've found uh, this happens. The office building we're in, and just as tenants, we have nothing to say about it, that this happens. It's starting to happen right now. We're on the north side of the building. And uh, by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you can feel the heat coming right through the wall of the building and it's all being re-radiated off windshields of cars that are parked facing the building.